Okay, uh, welcome. So, uh, the plan is to move on to a new topic today, which is really quite different from the course so far. And uh, but before I do that, uh, any questions on the uh, what we discussed last time, which was something about disordered metals, localization, and uh, random matrix theory of disordered metals. Okay. All right. So uh, what we're going to talk about today is, uh, you know, a state of matter that's uh, that's not a Fermi liquid. So, uh, you know, we uh, we've started with the gelium model where you had this electrons with Coulomb interactions and treated the Coulomb interactions in some kind of uh, uh, mean field theory where we summed up the long range Coulomb interaction and found screening. Uh, but in the end, the basic picture that there were uh, a bunch of quasi particles uh, with some renormalized effective mass and a Fermi surface uh, survived uh, all of those manipulations. Um, then we are start, also started talking about the condo lattice, where we had uh, at least some fraction of the sites had a very strong interactions, so strong that the number of the electrons didn't fluctuate at all. Uh, but remarkably, we found even in that case, if you went to low enough temperatures, uh, these spins on the condo sites actually became part of the Fermi surface, and you got a theory of uh, heavy electrons, very, very heavy electrons. Uh, and with the Fermi surface that counted even the stationary electrons. Uh, so the quasi-particle concept is uh, extremely robust uh, and obviously uh, works all the way from essentially zero interactions uh, to infinity, you know, because the, in, in the condo lattice effectively they interact with infinity on, on the sites with zero charge fluctuations. Uh, so in that context, it was a big surprise in the uh, you know, 80s, early 80s, and and, all, and onward, the people have been discovering lots and lots of materials, metals. Uh, these are usually intermetallic compounds uh, with many sites with you know localized D-like orbitals uh, and strong interactions. So there's a lot of magnetism around. Uh, but you dope a magnet, you you move away from the insulating state. Uh, like, of course, most famously in the cuprate superconductors. Uh, and what you get is a metallic state, which, um, uh, you know, doesn't look like a Fermi liquid. The temperature depends, the resistivity is wrong. Uh, if you look for Fermi surfaces, you know, you, you don't find sharp quasi particles. And even if you do, it can sometimes have uh, uh, shapes that don't make much sense based on the Lutinger theorem. Uh, the optical conductivity doesn't look uh, very, uh, you know, very Fermi liquid like at higher, somewhat higher frequencies, uh, and on and on. So, there's a long list of observables uh, from many, many probes which says that somehow uh, Fermi liquid theory is breaking down. Now, one way you can break Fermi liquid theory uh, is. Uh, you know, we've already studied, uh, well, on the not this semester, I guess, very much, uh, uh, the one-dimensional electron gas. Uh, and in the one-dimensional electron gas, there are no electron quasi-particles. But there are other types of quasi-particles. These are collective, uh, uh, by, you know, so compressive density oscillations of the, of the one-dimensional electron gas, which effectively behave like free bosons. Uh, and you can build out even the electron operator out of these uh, density fluctuations. So the one dimensional electron gas, you know, depending on your definition is a non-Fermi liquid, uh, but it's not a system without quasi particles. Now it could well be that uh, the two dimensional strange metals and higher dimensional strange metals that people see are like the one dimensional metal. That is, there's some kind of uh, description in terms of some hidden Quasi particles that no one's ever seen. And the electron is some composite of these hidden quasi particles. Uh, that's not ruled out. And uh, there's been no shortage of proposals of that type, uh, including, I think, you know, uh, by Phil Anderson. I think that was seen to be his model in some of the papers that he wrote down. 
Uh, okay, well, that could be the case, but uh, my personal opinion, and that's not the case. Uh, higher dimensions are really different. Uh, and we have many examples of systems um, not, you know, not as well understood as the 1D model, where in fact there are no quasi particles. Uh, the simplest example, in a way, uh, is the, you know, it's like two plus one dimensional Ising model. It's an insulator. You take the two plus one dimensional Ising model, you put it at its critical point, and then you get this conformal field theory in higher dimensions, which describes uh, a state without quasi particle excitations. Uh, so that's again something we studied a bit last semester. Uh, however, you know that's not that's not a metal. It's uh, it's a it's a very rigid density. It's just a bunch of spins. You can't chain the density of electrons without losing the insulating behavior. Uh, I can't compute things like conductivity, resistivity, or anything like that. It's got a gap to all charge excitations. So what we would like is 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 a, is a is a model for uh, strong interactions in a metal so that you lose the quasi particle concept. Okay, so that's a, uh, that's a difficult question, which has been, you know, people have been studying a lot in the last 20 years. Uh, and I would say at this point, there are basically two examples, uh, and we're going to study both in the remaining part of the course. That's what the rest of the course is about. Uh, is just study these models of systems uh, without quasi-particle excitations. So one model uh, is, of course, the SYK model, which I'm going to talk about today. Uh, and it's, you know, seemingly an artificial model. <laughs> Not seemingly, it is an artificial model. Uh, it's got, as you'll see, lots of randomness in it, but somehow the randomness is not so strong. Comes appears in a way that it self-averages. And that's something we already saw for the random matrix model uh, yesterday, our last lecture. And, and that in fact was the motivation for introducing the random matrix model because uh, we're gonna try to, it was so simple to solve the random matrix model uh, for self-averaging quantities. We're gonna now look at interactions in the random matrix model and hope to find a regime where in fact you get a, a state, a metallic state here by, in a random matrix of biometal, I simply mean a state where it continues to vary uh, the density of electrons. So you can just have a chemical potential which you can tune uh, and you still get basically the same state. Uh, that's the kind of state I want. Uh, and the simplest model which displays such a state turns out to be a model with randomness. Now, you know, many people get very upset when you start talking about random systems especially field theorists, particle theorists, but uh, that's changing now in the, in the particle system world also. Uh, people are finding uh, in the last couple of years in particle theory that if you take, uh, you know, if you take some very strongly coupled conformal field theory, you can't say much about it. Uh, but if you average over a set of similar conformal field theories, uh, you get a very simple description in terms of some gravitational theory. And this is now leading to all kinds of progress in uh, uh, understanding the role of quantum gravity near black holes. So, so the idea is, I think, is a very powerful one. It seems so that now randomness helps you make makes life simple. Um, and roughly speaking, it does so because of the presence of self-averaging. I mean, we're going to talk about a uh, a system without quasi-particles with lots and lots of decay of excitations into multiple other excitations. And roughly this means that it's a, it's a system that uh, doesn't have too much quantum interference. You know, we saw how quantum interference uh, led to localization. And then that was a dramatic change in the nature of the Fermi liquid. States start localizing and then you get an insulator. Uh, and in fact, exactly where they localize depend on exactly what the random potential is. You have a very deep well, that's where the electron will go, and so on. So that's the kind of thing you might worry here. You're introducing randomness. Well, wouldn't you get some fluctuations because of some traps that the electron would fall into and won't that dominate everything? Uh, it's now quite clear for the SYK model because there's so much study of it that that's not, that, that simply doesn't happen. People have tested that numerically. 
Uh, and roughly speaking, the reason it happens is again uh, this absence of quasi particles. You know, once you it's, you need well-defined quasi particles with the same phase that live for a long time to get any quantum interference effect of that type, uh, and that's just simply absent in non-Fermi liquids uh, of the type you're discussing. Uh, and that's roughly why you know randomness is not such a big thing, uh, and allows you to make uh, remarkable progress. Uh, okay, so that's uh, all right. That's model number one of a non-Fermi liquid. Uh, model number two is something we'll uh, study. But well, let's see, we have five lectures, so maybe they're somewhere halfway, two and a half, or SYK and two and a half of the other model. Uh, and, and the other model is uh, appears uh, most famously in the new equals of a half fractal quantum Hall state, but it also appears in various models of spin liquids. Uh, and it's basically a Fermi surface coupled to some uh, gapless boson, some boson with which has a long range uh, critical spectrum. And the boson could be gapless because it's a gauge field or it could be gapless because uh, you've tuned the system to a very special point where you have a phase transition to the onset of some kind of broken symmetry. And right at that critical point, your order parameter is a boson that's gapless. Uh, and then you couple that to Fermi surface and ask, you know, can something interesting happen? So those models are not solvable, uh, but, uh, you know, we're starting to understand a lot about them. And, uh, and there are many similarities to the SYK model, and that's why I'm presenting it in the order that I am. So let's start with the model where we're, it's a model, uh, but you know, at this point, so much is understood about it and checked with, uh, by numerics uh, and all kinds of uh, analytic analysis that uh, we can be pretty confident that everything I'm gonna tell you is correct. Uh, well modular mistakes I make, uh, but if I understood what other papers correctly, then we, we, and we have a pretty good understanding of what's going on. All right, so let me just begin by uh, introducing the Hamiltonian. So here it is. Um, so this is our generalization. So the random matrix model, it's sometimes called the, uh, uh, I'm going to call it H2, for reason will become clear in a minute. It's so one over square root of n. So one ij, tij, c dagger i, cj. So in the random matrix model, you had electrons that were hopping from site to site uh, with a uh, with a random coupling tij, which had two indices. So that's why it's called H two because of the two indices on the tij. So now you uh, generalize to this model, which we can uh, temporarily call H4. And the reason we call it H4 is because now there are four indices here uh, that, are, that this interaction has. Uh, I goes from one to N, uh, and these now couple to the electron operators in this way. So this type of four index randomness was introduced by Kitab with the K. Um, uh, you know, with my first student, Jin Wu Ye, I had introduced another model, which was, was called the SY model for a while. Uh, I won't talk about it here. Uh, that has only two index randomness, but it still has four Fermi interactions. Uh, it's a bit more complicated, but it's much more realistic for physical applications. Uh, and its properties are essentially identical. So well, that's why I won't talk about it. Anyway, so here, so the Kitev model had uh, Majorana fermions. And the Majorana fermions are, you know, not what appears in real life, except in superconductors or some very special spin liquids. Uh, so from a condensed matter point of view, it's not very uh, realistic. Uh, so this is where I'm not taking Majorana fermions, but ordinary fermions, uh, electrons that hop from site to site. Uh, and in a way that there's a conserved quantity. So the total number of electrons is not changed by this interaction. So basically what's happening in this term, if you want to draw a picture, uh, is you have four sites. You have site I and site J, any site. And there's two other sites, K and L. 
uh, and what happens uh, uh, that that these both of these electrons uh, go from ij to kl uh, and there's a matrix element for that two particle tunneling uh, ij kl u i j kl so you have a bunch of sites this if you want to think of them as sites they could be orbital labels could be anything uh, and you pick four of them uh, if two of them happen to be occupied and the other two empty, then you can, there's an amplitude for the two that are occupied to tunnel to the two that are empty. And, and what is the amplitude for that process? Uh, well, it's a random number, UIJKL. Uh, and the basic, okay, so that's uh, some kind of, you know, if, this, if these were orbital labels, uh, this is the kind of interaction, this is sometimes called a, uh, Kanamori, how about Kanamori Hamiltonian for us many orbital atom uh, where you have all these different matrix elements between the different orbitals of an atom. Uh, and you know this number can become quite large in a, in a heavy uh, element, uh, you know, depending on orbit uh, various degeneracies and so on. Uh, and so there's quite a large number of these uh, these parameters. And if I give you any set of parameters, a fixed set of parameters, uh, once n is bigger than about 20 or so, uh, it's almost impossible. It's essentially impossible to find the eigenstates of this Hamiltonian. Uh, okay, for any given fixed set. But if I think of this system as self averaging, just as we thought of this uh, random matrix to be self averaging, uh, then uh, it turns out that we can solve for many, many things uh, in the limit of n goes to infinity with the most important assumption that these UIJKL are all independent random numbers. As long as they're independent random numbers, um, you, can, you can just essentially solve the problem. Uh, and you end up getting a state that way, which in fact is a non-Fermi liquid and no, no quasi-particle excitations. Uh, and again, there's a lot of evidence from that, from calculations I'll describe and many numeric uh, tests and so on. Um, okay. Um, what else was I gonna say? Yeah, so and one, and one of the remarkable features, uh, which will, I think, yeah, I'll probably get to that in my lectures, uh, is that the self-averaging here uh, is actually stronger so for this system is much stronger than the self averaging here. And the reason is that, you know, when you are, when you are solving this system, suppose you have n sites, and let's say there's uh, n over two electrons, so half of them are filled. Okay, so there's n sites. So, and you have, uh, you know, 100 sites in 50 electrons. So for to solve this problem, I had to only diagonalize a 100 by 100 matrix. And I got the 100 uh, eigenvalues and I filled the lowest 50 of them. That was the many body ground state of this Hamiltonian. And so the self averaging that occurs is the self averaging over these 50 occupied states. You know, they come at sort of random energies, and you, once you sum over all of them, you start getting numbers that are not so random. Uh, however, here, so let's start. Suppose I had 100 sites and 50 electrons. Uh, how many states do I have? Well, this is not a one particle problem. And if I'm just counting in the uh, grand canonical ensemble, uh, then the total number of states is 100 choose 50, uh, which is a gigantic number. I don't know. <laughs> it's of order two to the two to the hundred or something like that. Uh, that's a gigantic number. That's how big a matrix I have to diagonalize to get all the energy levels, the many body energy levels. And it's I have to sum over these many body energy levels, every one of them to get anything any Green's function that I want to compute. Uh, so since I'm summing over two to the hundred levels, you can be pretty confident that the answer won't depend on the details because there's so many states that you're looking at. And, and that's really the beauty of putting in randomness and strongly interacting systems. They just self-average extremely well. Okay. Uh, you know, I'm saying these things that it sound totally obvious, but Obviously, these, 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 these concepts were not obvious. Uh, this would have been done ages ago if that was so obvious. But now that we have this model and studied it so much, uh, these concepts are becoming evident. Okay, so, so we're going to solve this problem. 
Uh, and in fact, we'll find a non Fermi liquid state for a range of values of mu, close to mu equals zero. Uh, and associated with mu, uh, there's a total number of electrons, and I'm going to call that a number Q. Uh, and Q, obviously, I'm ignoring the spin of the electrons. So Q has to be between uh, zero and one. And I'm going to mostly specialize to Q equals one half, the half filling case. Uh, because while things are a bit simpler, the nodes are actually for general Q, but while I'm presenting, I'll just stick to Q equals one half because the whole, uh, the, the analysis is a lot simpler. Uh, yeah. Just the, it's, it's not that different. It's just uh, the number of symbols I have to write is a bit less. And uh, so I won't clutter up the, uh, the page. Okay, so I have this interaction, U, I, J, K, L. Uh, and now I want to compute things. Okay, so particles going in and particles going out. Okay, so this is U, and it has a property that the average of U is zero, uh, and the average of U squared uh, is some number which we just call U squared. These are used with indices, so that's why this. Oops. Uh, one more thing I should say, uh, I guess the question comes up, what if I had both terms? What if I had this term and this term? Uh, well, so that's also been studied. It's a little bit more complicated. We studied this term and it gave a Fermi liquid. Uh, we'll study this term now and find it doesn't give a Fermi liquid. So what if you have both? Well, it turns out if you have both, ultimately at very low temperatures, uh, this is more important than that and you get back a Fermi liquid. But it happens at a very low energy scale and no lower than you would naively expect. You know, naive guess would be okay. Uh, once your temperature is uh, smaller than little t, uh, then uh, then your then this term is most important. Uh, but if your temperature is bigger than little t, uh, but smaller than u, maybe you can get a non fermi liquid. In fact, that turns out to be not correct. You have to go to a much smaller temperature before this term finally uh, wins the day. Okay. So we just look at the case where that is zero now, there's no H2, all right. So we go ahead and just, you know, we do exactly what we did for the random matrix problem. Uh, we go ahead and start writing down diagrams, order by order in U, and then averaging each diagram over the ensemble of Hamiltonians. Uh, so the first diagram obviously is something like this. For the Green's function, oh, something like this, you have a U, Uh, like that, that's the, you know, that uh, when you average over this thing, that of course gives you zero uh, because of this term here. You know, in some ways, the entire course so far has been about this diagram. All of Hartree-Fock theory is essentially looking at this diagram in a self-consistent way. And if you now change the orientation of the arrows, uh, then they get VCS theory. <laughs> you just looking at this kind of diagram over and over again. So the whole course is really about, been about this diagram. Um, even the exotic gauge field uh, are some kind of factorization of, of these uh, uh, spin-ons and they give you all of that. All right, so, so finally we found a theory where this diagram that has been the subject of the entire course is zero. So we have to go to next order to get any interaction correction at all. All right, so what are the diagrams you get at next order? Uh, well, so you can uh, imagine writing down various diagrams. Uh, so, you know, you can have something like this, I suppose. Something like this, I suppose. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, 
All right, okay. So that's another one diagram of order u squared. Uh, and another one uh, is this diagram. Okay, you have a u here and a u here. Okay. <laughs> All right. So now we have to uh, put the indices in and see what happens. And just remember that the different, as long as, so the two U's have to have exactly the same index. Otherwise, we forget about it. Uh, All right. So the two U's have to have the same index. So, so this is site I. Let's just put some indices here. Um, this is site J. And that's like K and this side like L. Uh, so that's the outgoing line. So this will still be site K here. This will be site L. And those two have to be uh, equal to I. I and J for, for us to get any answer at all. Uh, and that must mean I must equal J because this i is coming back to j. So that's fine. We are happy to live with that, uh, that the uh, this index must be the same, i, i. OK, good. All right, so there seems to be some answer there. Uh, and k and l can be anything. So we can sum over k and l. So what we have is 1 over sum over k and l. And then we have u squared. Uh, but remember this all important factor, which I didn't mention, sorry. I put a factor of one over n to the three halves out front. Uh, and this is put for the same reason you put it over here. We want the bandwidth uh, of a single particle excitation energy to be a part of one in the thermodynamic limit. Uh, and we'll see that turns out for this case. So there's a one over n to the three halves here. So if I look at this diagram, um, I have one over n cubed. And there's a free sum over k and l. So that gives me u squared over n, uh, which goes to zero uh, as n goes to infinity. So we can even forget about that fact. Uh, and so you come to the most important diagram, of course. This is i, j, k, l. And now these have to match, so and no trouble matching K, L, J, and so that must be I. Okay, and now what is this equal to is one over N to the cubed from the two U's. And now you have sum over J, K, L times U squared. Uh, and that gives me basically U squared, no N. So this is the only, di this is the diagram that survives, okay. Uh, and so this diagram is, I don't know, uh, called a melon diagram. Doesn't look like a melon to me, uh, but that's what people have started calling it. Uh, actually, it was my student and I in my, on our paper that we first wrote down this diagram in this form. We certainly think of melons, but now I think if you take what's called the HQ Hamiltonian, uh, we have Q for me on it, Q index randomness. Uh, then uh, you get Q lines in here, and then it starts looking like a melon or something. Okay. All right. So order U squared is just one diagram. Uh, so now you can start going. You, of course, at order U cubed, it's got to be zero. So you have to go to order U to the fourth uh, and ask what happens. Uh, so you can start looking at order U to the fourth, and uh, I won't, uh, you know, there are many diagram that are possible at order u to the fourth. Uh, there are some, some of them that uh, I'll draw that you'll, you'll recognize are actually not really new diagrams, something like this. So this is the order u to the fourth and, you know, Uh, and you can, you know, there's a uh, you here, you here, you here, you here. Uh, and this is clearly about a u to the fourth. Uh, and there's an n, the ends will cancel out because this product of two 
uh, of the various uh, diagrams you saw before. This will be I, and that will be I, and that will still be I. Okay, so this diagram we have to keep, but that's no problem. We know how to keep such diagrams. Uh, you just use Dyson's equation, just put it in the self energy. Okay, and then what other diagrams can you imagine in order u to the fourth? You can also imagine something like this. And, and lots of its cousins, something like this. Okay, uh, so this, uh, how about this one? And, and this also, uh, you know, it's obviously about a U to the fourth because this is inside one of these propagators. So it's like a melon within a melon uh, and that you have to keep obviously. So we have to keep this one, we have to keep this one and you can imagine other places of putting the melon within a melon into this line and so on. So, and again, this is not such a difficult thing to keep. All we do is just replace the screens function line by the fully renormalized screens function line. So there's a G there uh, that you keep to all orders. Okay, uh, the full G and the full G here and the full G there. And you put everything in the self energy. So no problem, we can also keep this. So these are not really genuinely new diagram. So the question you have to ask, is there any genuinely new diagram um, at order U to the four? So you can sit down and try to draw a few, you know, something that's completely different. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm just improvising here. So I'll try to do something. You have four, you have to have four interactions. Um, so you could imagine some, you know, this coming in and maybe one goes here and the other one goes there. And this one. Okay. And then you're going to have another line coming out of here. Uh, so let's see. Going into this, something like that. And then uh, probably something here and something there, something there. Okay, I think that you put the arrows in and hopefully that comes up. Okay, there's some kind of complicated diagram like that. You could imagine an order U to the fourth. Uh, and I'll let you look at the number of free indices here, uh, whether this gap, and, and I'm not going to get it, go try to do it here. You can try to do it in you know, privacy or your own desk. And uh, I, uh, but I won't try it because I'm sure I'll get it wrong. But what, I'm, what I know for sure uh, is that there'll be some end to some positive number here and to some factor. And so you can throw this thing out because the number of free indices won't equal uh, how many free indices you need. And you need six free indices to get a term of order u to the four because there's a prefactor of one over n to the six. <clears throat> All right, so you can keep trying and what you find uh, is that uh, at the end of the day, there is no other diagram other than the ones you've already seen and they're copies. Uh, so, and that's the entire story. Uh, now, of course, this seems, you know, kind of ad hoc. I haven't proven this. Uh, we'll prove this later by using the Pythagorean method. Uh, you can see this in a few lines. Uh, in fact, that's the way we originally did it. And uh, I, I never told these diagrams when you were coming up with this. Uh, but uh, yeah, if you look at the final result, it's clear that that's what ha what's happening. All right, so the net result from all of these pictures uh, is that we can now write down the Green's function in a very simple way. Uh, and the Green's function now, where did it go? Okay. So basically there's only one diagram to worry about and we put that equal to the self energy. The self energy is equal to this. That's it. A U here and a U here. 
So what's our Green's function? Well, our Green's function, first of all, gi j of omega, it's completely diagonal uh, times one over i omega plus mu as usual, minus the self energy. And I have to be, we're going to do a lot of analytic stuff here. So I better be careful about all my factors of i. So I'm working on the imaginary time Green's function. So the frequency is along the imaginary axis. And then I have this expression for sigma and sigma turns out to be the following. Now here, in fact, it's better to write this in, in the time representation, not the frequency representation. Uh, you can write it in frequency if you want, uh, but then you'll have to, you have these two, two loop, it'll be like, it'll be like a two loop expression. Uh, so sigma, but I'm gonna do it in space time. So this is some time zero, that's time tau. Then sigma of tau, this is imaginary time, uh, is going to be u squared times d of tau whole squared times g of minus tau. And uh, I always forget the sign. You have to carefully look at the sign. And uh, I believe it's uh, a minus, yes, okay. So there it is. And finally, you also have the, let's look at half filling. Uh, and a half filling the can C dagger C should be equal to on any site, no sum over I uh, should equal to basically um, G of tau equals zero minus with no minus sign, I believe. Let me double check, yep. Uh, and that should equal we're going to focus on the case one half. Uh, and for this case, it's not because it's one half is a particle hole symmetric point, uh, which means forward in time and backward in time, and positive frequency, negative frequency should basically be the same. Uh, and, and so then it's no surprise that at half filling, uh, mu equals zero. So we can, just, we can just ignore that for now. Although the nodes consider the general mu case, we can just put mu equal to zero. So that's it. So these are the equations we have to solve uh, now. Uh, nothing more. So the big part of the rest, yeah, actually I'm certain the rest of this lecture and maybe more will be the mathematical problem of solving these equations. You know, and this is a, these are complicated equations. First of all, you have to remember the spectral representation that the Green's function is supposed to obey. It has to be analytic in the upper half plane in the frequency space uh, with a branch cut along the real frequency axis. And, uh, and so you have to remember all that. And then you have these two equations, both of which are nonlinear, uh, but one of which is simple to write in frequency space and the other is simple to write in, in time space. Uh, and so if you write, try to write everything in, uh, in frequency space, uh, you end up with some kind of complicated integral differential equation that you have to solve. Uh, okay, but it's you know not impossible to solve. It's just some nonlinear integral differential equations. Uh, you could just put it into a computer and solve them. Uh, and so uh, when I first wrote down these equations, I said, well, okay, may maybe in a couple of months we'll understand everything about these equations. <laughs> I couldn't have been more wrong. Uh, it was easy to understand some simple things, which I'll talk about now, uh, but people are still discovering uh, new things about these equations. Uh, and a recent paper by uh, Maria and others has uh, you know, cataloged various kinds of subleading behaviors, which are related in fact to concepts in quantum gravity. Uh, and ultimately all of that is just comes out of solving these equations. <laughs> So there's a lot of richness here and it's surprisingly um, complicated, but also very elegant. There's a lot of structure that emerges, some of which I'm gonna describe. All right, so that's, we now 
kind of going to turn to a mathematical problem of solving these equations. I've given a rather general physical discussion of why we should be interested in these equations. Uh, so any questions on that before we embark on the mathematical solution? Okay, so, all right, so let me present one very important argument, uh, which, you know, you know, which is kind of surprising in the end, and it was it took me by surprise when I first realized that this was the case for these equations, uh, because there were other equations people had been studying at that time for random systems which didn't have this feature. But this one does. Uh, and the answer is that, you know, first of all, what, it could be that there is no solution to these equations and uh, uh, for a given density. So, well, there's one solution I know for sure where I have no electrons, and another solution where I have every site is filled with electrons. That's obviously an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian uh, because. There's no, there's only one state at that density, and the Hamiltonian conserves the number of particles. Uh, so it could be that those are the only solutions, and that at other densities there's nothing else. There's no other solution of this type. Uh, that's definitely not true. We know there are other solutions now. So you can ask. Suppose I found a solution, and you can ask then, uh, what about the excitations about the ground state that you found? Does it have a gap? Can it have a gap? Uh, and the simple answer is no. And it's quite kind of interesting to see how that, how that happens, because we'll also use that in, in finally solving the equation. So what you want to do is you want to take your Green's function, g of omega, And again, I refer you to the typewritten notes for get, where we get all the signs and the factors of pi correct. Uh, be something like this d omega over pi times some density rho of omega or uh, well, i omega n minus omega. So that's the spectral representation. And if you just look at the general uh, exact eigenstate Lehman spectral representation, uh, you can show that for fermions, this is not too difficult, uh, that rho of omega um, in this way of writing is always less than zero for all omega, for fermions. So what we ultimately want to do is find a solution to these equations here for rho of omega. And you can think of these two equations as some very complicated nonlinear integral equation for rho of omega. Uh, okay, so, and, and we are looking at mu equals zero. So what possibly could rho omega look like? Okay, so here's omega, that's zero, and there's rho of omega. Uh, I'll call minus rho of omega so that I get a positive number. Okay. Uh, so what could that look like? So one possibility at t equals zero, we're going to work at t equals zero, uh, that rho of, and it's even, with at q equals one half, particle symmetric, so it's an even function of omega, t equals zero, q equals one half. Uh, the argument goes through for it, even if it's not even, but let's make life simple. Um, so if it's even, let's assume it has a gap, meaning it's zero for a while, uh, and then it's non-zero, something like this. You know, this is the kind of thing you might find in a superconductor. There's a gap delta here. So let's assume uh, there's a gap, okay, for G of omega. And we can do the same thing for the self-energy. We can also write the self-energy in its own spectral representation. No. Uh, 
Okay. So now I made a, a guess that rho of omega has a gap and the value of the gap is delta. Okay. So what can I say now? Now let's go back to Dyson's equation. Now if I look at Dyson's equation, oh, where is it? Well, this equation, uh, what can I say? Now let me go to real frequencies. So when real frequencies, uh, and I go to real frequencies, this omega becomes real. There's no I there. Uh, but I've told you that the Green's function has an imaginary part for omega bigger than delta uh, on real frequency. So this is, this is equivalent to statement because rho of omega is minus the uh, imaginary part uh, of g of omega. So what, what I'm claiming is that uh, the imaginary part of g of omega is not is is equal to zero for omega less than delta actually mod omega less than delta so there's a gap meaning the imaginary part of g is zero and above that it's not zero okay so if i if so if i put i omega equals capital omega here what i see is that if the imaginary part of g is zero then the imaginary part of sigma also has to be zero because everything else is real. If I had some imaginary part here, I'll get an imaginary part when I take the imaginary part of this and that will be nonsense. So therefore I conclude just from the, uh, from Dyson's equation, so Dyson's equation tells me uh, tells me that sigma of omega also must be zero for omega less than delta, if they satisfy these equations. Okay, so, all right. So now let me go to the other equation, this equation. What does this tell me about the gap? So G of omega, I assumed had a gap. This also has a gap. What does this tell me about the gap in sigma? This equation told me that the gap in sigma equals the gap in G. What does this tell me? Okay, so here uh, you really have to, uh, um, okay, I, I know a quick way to get the answer for the particle hole symmetric case in it. anyway. All right, so now like, so we want to translate this uh, statement here uh, to tau space. What does this statement mean in tau space? So in tau space, this tells me that G of tau as mod tau goes to infinity, uh, it goes as E to the minus delta mod tau. So it decays exponentially in time. And how, do, how can I do that? Well, I have to do a little bit of algebra here. I have to take the Fourier transform of this expression. Uh, and the Fourier transform of the if you, so what you have to do is you take the, you know, um, well, let me, let me show you how it's done. So G of tau is equal to sum on omega n, T sum on omega n, and then G of omega, I write as D omega over pi, uh, E to the, uh, okay, I have to get the sign right. Uh, I omega and tau really, no minus here, minus. Uh, or I omega n. Okay, so now you have to do the sum over omega n. But we are at zero temperature, which is an integral over omega n, you can do it. Uh, and what you find uh, when you collect everything together, up to factors of pi or two that I won't get right. The d of g of tau is zero to infinity. It's very simple. It's d omega rho of omega e to the minus omega tau. Uh, this is for omega greater than g of tau greater than zero is equal to this. And if tau is less than zero, it's a clear corresponding expression, which is in the notes. Okay, so that tells you 
that at zero temperature, the Green's function is just a Laplace transform of the spectral density. So very standard result to, to remember that uh, when you take the spectral density, which is the imaginary part of the Green's function along the real axis, the Green's function on the imaginary axis is the Laplace transform of that. Okay, so from here, I can easily see then what happens as tau goes to infinity. Well, as tau goes to infinity, I'm going to be dominated by the smallest possible value of omega. And if the smallest possible value of omega is delta, then this must be the case. G of tau decays at e to the minus delta tau as tau goes to infinity. And similarly, I also conclude that sigma of tau uh, goes to infinity by the same, the same rule, sigma of tau. has the same gap, delta of tau. Okay, so now uh, let me plug this in here. And I come up with a problem. On the right hand side, I have e to the minus, and take tau to infinity. As tau goes to infinity, this is decaying as e to the minus delta tau. This is also decaying as e to the minus delta tau. So the whole thing decays as e to the minus three delta tau. Uh, now, if you're not at the particle hole symmetric point, there can be different gaps, particles and holes, but you, if that doesn't save the day, you look at it more carefully. Uh, anyway, so e to the minus three delta tau here, and that's e to the minus delta tau. That obviously can't be consistent. You can't have a function which decays with different exponents on the left and the right hand side as tau goes to infinity. Uh, and this equation has to hold for all tau. So we're just looking at large tau and we come up with a contradiction. So the only solution, uh, uh, since you argued to ourselves to a contradiction, so we must have uh, delta equals zero. So if there's any solution, uh, even in our filling, uh, which has a gap that's impossible. It's got to be gapless. It's got to have lots, you know, like a Fermi liquid. It's got to be something that has uh, low energy expectations all the way down to zero frequency. So then the question becomes, uh, how many low energy excitations does it have? Uh, I have? Five minutes left. So I don't know if I'm going to answer that question now. Um, yeah, so this is done in uh, some very complicated way, uh, but let me at least remember that notation and strict ourselves to. So what we're going to assume now, uh, that G of tau, it can't have a gap. Uh, and so if I look at this Laplace transform here, uh, rho of omega is non-zero all the way down to omega equals zero. So for example, if rho of omega was a constant, I'll get e to the minus, uh, I'll get, when I take the Laplace transform, I'll get one over tau. If it vanished with some power of omega, I'll get some other power of tau. So it seems very clear the only other possibility for a gapless solution, that there's some power law singularity as tau goes to zero. So let's assume uh, that g of tau, uh, again, for the particle hole symmetric case, is some coefficient a over um, mod tau to some exponent, which I'll call alpha, as alpha goes to infinity. Uh, sorry, as tau goes to infinity. What is alpha? Well, we don't know yet. We're going to try to find out. What is a? We're also going to try to find out. Uh, but let's assume that's the case. All right, so now I can very quickly then find what rho of omega does as omega goes to zero, because the large time behavior in a Laplace transform, uh, the behavior at large time is dominated by the behavior at small omega, but that's when the exponential will be least, will be the, the largest. 
So rho of omega uh, must vanish with the power law, but what power law it is, is it? Well, you can just do kind of dimension counting. Uh, you know, omega has the inverse dimension of tau, or you can actually do the integral with all the gamma functions, which is done in the notes. Uh, so let's assume omega is some rho of omega is some omega to the power beta. And then this integral is a standard integral involving gamma functions, and you can figure it out. Uh, and what will you get then? So, so g of tau, t of omega, or rho of omega, from that kind of argument will be a times some number involving some gamma functions uh, to omega to some power. What power will it be? Well, it's going to be omega to the power. Uh, well, I can tell you quickly how I figured this out. It'll be one minus alpha. Uh, and the way I figured it out is you just, you know, to get from tau to omega, you do one integral. Uh, I, I just say that rho of omega is some with some imaginary parts, but I'm just counting powers here. Some integral d tau of g of tau. So this is tau to the alpha one of this goes as tau to the one over alpha. This is alpha. So the whole thing has dimension one minus alpha. And then you invert it, you go from omega to tau and you can see that's what it is. Okay, that's just power counting or dimension counting. Uh, and so this is the behavior of rho of omega. And with it, and of course you can get the number as you've done the notes by doing those integrals more carefully. And this is uh, as, uh, sorry. Okay. So I, I have made some assumptions about the asymptotic behavior of g of tau and rho of omega. And now I have to plug these assumptions in uh, into the, the main equations, these equations, and solve for a and alpha. Okay, I'll stop here, but that can be done. You put it, put it in here, just do lots of Laplace transforms and back and forth, uh, and you find the solution under certain conditions, which we'll describe. Uh, and uh, so at least then you find from that that uh, some solution exists. I mean, it's possible to get a solution with the power law singularity. That's all it tells us. It doesn't tell that's actually a solution because you only examine very large tau and very small omega. To find a solution at all omega, we have to actually solve it. So, so but they have some hope that there might be such a solution, but there's no proof. So in fact, you know, when we first wrote all these equations, uh, you know, we looked at them numerically and started looking for solutions and it wasn't even clear that the matrix was uh, converging. So it, it wasn't at all clear that the solution was actually a solution. Uh, uh, eventually the numerics improved enough that we started feeling more confident and wrote up the result. But <laughs> uh, it was not at all clear uh, that this was a sensible procedure. But now there's no doubt. Uh, luckily, uh, you know everything that was said in my first paper is correct, uh, and uh, you can numerically check it, uh, and uh, everything works from you know just from first principle numerics, where you actually take an ensemble of Hamiltonians like this and put them on the computer, and go ahead and diagonalize. You know, for twenty sites, you have two to the twenty states to diagonalize, but you can do it, and in the end, the results agree quite well uh, with the solution I'm describing. Okay, I'll stop there. Any questions? And we'll continue uh, more on the SYK model on Monday, and also a discussion tomorrow. Incidentally, sometimes I late to the discussion. If, you, if I'm not there, you come. Just send me a note on Slack. That's more likely that I'll see it, <laughs> and that will remind me, and I'll be there. Okay, any other questions? Okay, then I'll see you maybe tomorrow and all right. have a good weekend.